I know there's eight cameras looking at me, but I can't see a single one of them. And that, that level of immersion for an actor is such a gift. Today I've got Anson Boone and Jacob Slater talk all about the new FX series, Pistol. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having us, Anna. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Nice to talk to you, too. I mean, I loved this show. You are playing these punk icons. Tell me about getting into character. That must have been so much fun. It was so much fun and it was a long process. We, we had a three month long band camp, which felt a little bit like a punk X Factor. So that, that's the best <laughs> way I can describe that thing. It was amazing, you know, it was the five of us in a room making music together from scratch for three months. And, uh, you know, it was quite, it's funny because it kind of reflected what the Pistols did, you know, they didn't have any formal training and they were just learning gig by gig and getting better and better throughout time. So we sort of channeled that ourselves and that punk energy and uh, put that into making the music. And then all the, all the gigs you see in the show were really performed live and we didn't do any pre-recording and no editing in post because it was important for our, di our director, Danny, to have live performance. And that's so much what the Sex Pistols were about. They were perfectly imperfect. So you get all these lumps and bumps of live performance. And to do that with my brothers was just the most amazing experience. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I mean, I've, I've been a fan of the Sex Pistols since I was about 14. So it was really nice to kind of dive in and get really hands on, you know, get your hands dirty with it. and. Yeah, we became the most, probably the most like committed Sex Pistols covers band there's ever been. Yeah, I think yeah. so too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say you guys are going to have to go out and tour after this because the, yeah. the performances, no, yeah. they're so much fun. I mean, what was, did you even remember that you were like filming half the time when you were performing these? No, this is the thing. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad it seems like that because that is actually how it was. We, we were talking earlier, it's just like, I remember specific moments. We were so lucky to shoot in these iconic locations in London, like the 100 Club and the Hammersmith Odeon. And y you know, you're surrounded by this incredible audience and the extras truly made this show. They were so incredible. They were so up for it. And all I can see is them and my bandmates and darkness, right? And I know there's eight cameras looking at me, but I can't see a single one of them. And uh, that level of immersion for an actor is such a gift. Um, and it really helped, I think, to, to make this show because you just got lost in it. And sometimes we might do a 10 minute long take during a gig where we just keep playing. And it felt like a real performance. Um, it didn't feel like making a TV show, which I, I think was good. You know, it felt very punk. Yeah, we just sort of became a band that happened to be being filmed sometimes. You know, yeah. it was it was really <laughs> funny. Yeah. What was the you know pressure or intimidation factor going into playing these icons who, you know, everyone knows and, and has an opinion about? I think, um, well, it's actually testament to, to the script writing from, from Craig actually reading through it. It's like, uh, obviously we are portraying them kind of as the icons that they are, but also as, as, as human beings. And they were written by Craig as human beings, which took a bit of the pressure off, I think, you know, because, you know, it, it, and it also gave them depth, you know, gave the characters depth and made them really, really interesting to kind of read into. Uh, so, yeah, it was more sort of fascinating than kind of, oh, my God, the pressure's on. Mm. You know? uh, well, yeah, there was a unique kind of pressure, I think, for me, because unfortunately, my character, John Lydon, w didn't want to be involved in the show. And I spent <laughs> so much time with yeah. him in my head with this three month band mm -hmm. camp and then the seven month long shoot and everything since. And I've genuinely become, I reckon, one of his biggest fans. That's what I'd argue. Yeah, with. Yeah. I'm yeah. such a yeah. big admirer of him. And uh, mm -hmm. what was fantastic actually is that Danny Boyle was such a huge fan of his as well. So we did form our own little John Lydon fan club on the set of trying to oh, incorporate the most amazing things that we admire about him into, into my performance. Um, so, you know, the added pressure of that really, but at the end of the day, what I could always rely on is that I, there was nothing negative for me with John Lydon. I truly like mm -hmm. him. So that, that's what I always went back to at the end of the day to, yeah. I'm a big Sex Pistols fan and you guys nailed it. And uh, I really loved watching the show. I can't wait for everyone to see it. Oh, that's good. That's what we want. Yeah, we want real yeah. fans yeah. to like it. That's great. Yeah. yeah Thank you very much. I'm it's glad awesome. Like it. Hey everyone, I'm Anna Rumor with Pop Culture. Today I've got Sydney Chandler, Tallulah Riley and Maisie Williams to talk all about the new FX series, Pistol Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Maisie, I love the shirt. I was gonna ask, you guys get to rock some amazing outfits uh, and, and fashion. Did any of you incorporate some of the uh, underground fashion into your personal style after filming this? 
No, Maisie's rejected it entirely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think the the thing that I definitely have taken, of course, like you know the outfits and like the way that I express myself, but it's more the attitude. I think the yeah. attitude that from where this expression kind of comes from, um, and the I guess like the confidence. You know, I, I, Jordan had such a strong sense of who she was, and so I think that I've really tried to take that with me in the next chapter of my career and tried to center in on that and yeah if that means like wearing a shirt like this or, or not like it's it's fun to see how that manifests i guess yeah i think it's it's yeah, interesting that. to think of um sort of sartorial choice as a political act or a social act and something you are projecting into the world i hadn't really thought of clothing in that way before i just thought of it in terms of dressing myself feeling comfortable etc but in a way you are presenting a canvas to the world and that's you know you're contributing to society in a way in you know one way or the other so that mm. was that's kind of strange to think about mm -hmm. and just learning about all of it as well we were talking earlier of how Vivian created this there's so much there's so much under the layers of just the clothes and I had no idea I had you know that was something that was so incredible about this job is I would have never you know done a deep dive into the Sex Pistols or Vivian Westwood and, and, and there's so much behind it and, and the clothes as a political act or as, it just, it, it does change it a bit, I think. Mm, um, for sure. Yeah. Well, and you're all playing such iconic women. I mean, did you have anything in particular that you did to get into these characters or to make them feel more real to you than just, you know, in history? I, I got out my sewing machine and started making clothes. So um, I made I made a skirt, which I, I still wear out. I'm very proud of um, and tried to do it in a Vivian-esque way and figured out the waistband myself. So, um, yeah, because she's such a sort of tactile. She works with mm -hmm. fabrics. She was making all the time. So I wanted to incorporate into that that physicality with her. You know, hands mm -hmm. are very important. Yeah. So I did a lot of a lot of doing and making. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. Yeah, I feel like, well, I mean, for both of us, the hair, we both had yeah, had mm -hmm. wigs, so that um, definitely helped. But I, I felt like I did a lot of work on, like, the, my posture and the way that I held myself. And, you know, being in the heels, being in the rubber, being, like, zipped and, like, pinched in and, and like, you know, your hair lifted, uh, I felt like that kind of really brought me into the... Yeah, into like the aura of Jordan, um, and she really, she was quite a like you know formidable like force, um, and I definitely like, uh, you know, in social situations, I definitely like played more of the like uh, passive like role. So it was like I think just having like a physical like holding my body in a in a, in a different way had a huge impact of the way that I could then perform. I think for me Absolutely. too, was, um, uh, being able to learn guitar and learn to sing, we had really um, an incredible, you know, few weeks, months of band camp, um, and uh, that was an incredible experience. And the the team that taught us to sing and, and to play that really, really helped um, me fall into my character because I didn't play guitar and I, I didn't sing and you know Chrissy taught herself and I was lucky enough to have a great team to help um, but doing that really felt um, you know when I started getting the bloody fingers and getting frustrated at three in the morning like I don't know what to do I can't play this guitar um, and then getting there and moving through that process and finding a love for music through it um, that was a huge gift for me and that really helped me um, kind of see see the joy and the passion in music and mm. and her her push for it. You know? I, I can't believe that. Oh, I love that. I, love that. Before. <laughs> I, I had a dressing room next to Sydney and I heard this beautiful sound and I was like, of singing. And I was like, who, what, like, what is that? Is she playing records? Like, what's she doing? And I had my, <laughs> my ear to the wall and then I came out late and I was like, was, was that you? And it was, she was practicing in her room, but it was so good. Like Thanks. it was beautiful. Oh. Like, it seems like you'd been classically trained since birth. Or Anne Marie was incredible. Okay. She taught me, she, she was an incredible, I don't know how she did it, but thank you. Well, I can't, I can't wait for everyone to see it. I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful show and I really appreciate all the time uh, that you t spent with me today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. Today I've got with us Louis Partridge and Emma Appleton to talk all about the new FX series, Pistol. Welcome. 
Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> hey. I mean, you are playing this iconic duo. Tell me a little bit about what it was like to take on these real life people and make them your own. It Ooh. was an undertaking, yeah. and you're right, they are an iconic duo. They're probably the, well, they're an early I mean, iconic. they're an infamous iconic they duo. Are. They are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You hear that word, that, that phrase flung about quite a lot, but they were mm -hmm. a true iconic duo. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, it seems like a bigger undertaking looking back now. I don't know about you, yeah. but when we were in it, it was like we were just treating it as a, a normal script, and obviously we were learning things and reading books and meeting people, but it was, you were really just trying to find the soul within these people, so it didn't seem like we mm -hmm. were taking on this uh, this monster that was you know yeah. these, these characters i kind of think we f mm -hmm. shut out like the classic sid and nancy kind of like yeah idea that we had and just looked at them as human beings and wanted to humanize mm -hmm. them as much as possible mm -hmm. and you know do our yeah. version of their relationship yeah. um and what that looked like yeah because once you've met as well the people that they were friends with um it it's kind of hard to reduce them to stereotypes so we Absolutely. really really keen to, and as was Craig and Danny, the writer and director, um, just keen to, to bring these people to life in a, in a true way. And what was it like developing your chemistry uh, as this you know, couple on screen? How did you develop that dynamic? It was so easy. It was so fun, <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> we did that day of improvisation. Yeah. Again, I always come back to this day. Yeah. Um, I think we just trusted each other really quickly mm -hmm. and we both really enjoy playing our characters and yeah. just just felt like we could like play around with them and you know let it happen very organically and naturally yeah. um and we could get things wrong it didn't matter yeah. um and i think we just had so much enjoyment in playing them yeah. and, and we wanted to really do it justice mm -hmm. and kind of commit to our own interpretations yeah. so yeah, we just played around with yeah. it for quite a while and we knew that we had some crazy scenes to do. So it was like, we're going to have to do it. So like, we're going to have yeah. to get our get our hands dirty, some, you know, laid down the line. So we might as well throw ourselves fully yeah. into it. Um, I think we right. wanted to be as comfortable as possible yeah. for when we got on set and we just right, knew our yeah, characters yeah, yeah. inside and out for whatever happened yeah. because Danny loves a bit of, bit of improv yes, here and yes, there. Yes, yes. So that makes yeah. it easier. Absolutely. Well, I, Emma, I mean, there's so many divisive opinions uh, about Nancy and, and her role in kind of the, the Sex Pistols story. How do you see her now that you've become so close to her as, a, as an actor? I think it was interesting for me because I use a lot of source material. I read a book that her mother wrote, um, which was very important mm -hmm. because, again, it was more about humanizing a character that we haven't seen on screen before. We've seen versions mm -hmm. of Nancy. We've heard a lot of stories about Nancy. And I wanted to take, you know, the emotional kind of vulnerable aspects as well and weave that into mm -hmm. the Nancy that Craig had written in the script. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just more about just really fleshing her out and seeing all sides of a human being rather than just the kind of the, the mythology of what we've heard and seen. Louis, I felt like you did a really good job with that, with Sid too, just Thank this you. really nuanced version of his character. What was that Thank like you. for you? Yeah, I we I yeah, I owe that quite a bit to, to Craig um and Danny, who really did want to 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 create that version of Sid that we haven't seen before and a version of Nancy that we mm -hmm. haven't seen before. Um but I found it really fulfilling to be telling um to be giving giving Sid a bit of humanity, I, I, I enjoyed that because it takes like five minutes. You listen to an interview of him and you're like, he's kind of, a, he's a thoughtful guy. He's, he's, mm -hmm. he's well, it's some interviews. I'll, I'll preface that because there are some, yeah. uh, he's, he's <laughs> far talk. from thoughtful. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's stuff going on behind, mm -hmm. you know, a guy with his shirt off. There's so much know. we don't know about people and I think it's easy yeah. for us to think that we yeah. know a thing when we didn't know them. Yeah. We still don't know them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you did a great job. I really enjoyed the series uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Today, I've got Craig Pierce and Thomas Brody Sangster to talk all about the new FX series, Pistol. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now, Thomas, taking on such an iconic role as Malcolm, was there anything in particular you did to get into character or like to really transform yourself into him? Oh, you mean on the day? What, what uh, any certain yeah. things that I yeah. do? Um, mm -hmm. hmm. 
I remember kind of playing with my mouth a bit before I'd go on to set, <laughs> just kind of loosening it up because he was quite mouthy. <laughs> um, and I, I think that kind of helped. I didn't, yeah, I didn't, he wasn't tight in the mouth. He was quite loose in the mouth and his lips would play. So I remember kind of playing with my mouth quite a bit before I'd go on to set. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, his chemistry with the band as the dynamic kind of shifts as they become more famous. It's so much fun to watch. What was that chemistry like off stage, and and then how did you kind of develop that as time went on? Well, the boys, uh, um, they, uh, I I joined quite late. They'd already been mm -hmm. cast for I think a couple of months, and they'd been at band camp, and yeah, um, so they were they were very tight. So I walked into um, to a kind of almost fully developed band and the first day they performed for me um, and it, it kind of felt like I was a manager already kind of assessing <laughs> their performance um, and I think they're actually quite nervous too as well um, but they were, yeah, they were yeah. really really sweet um, and they, they they really got along very well with one another and they brought this uh, intoxicating energy with them and they were young and still are young and full of life and vigor and it really excited um, so, which was great to walk into uh, to a production that's already rolling, even though we're just in rehearsal phase. It felt very much like it was full steam ahead. They used to pick you up and carry yeah. you around a lot. Yeah, they used to. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, they, they, for some reason they used to love picking me up and moving me around, which is in the show a few times actually. Yeah, um, Toby had a fascination right. with with lifting me. <laughs> he used to have just, a you know, you know, sex Toby's like, thing. Toby was always like, ah. Uh, if you, if you don't know what to do in a scene, just lift Malcolm up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She does a lot. Well, Craig, the casting on this project is just wonderful. Obviously, like the yeah. chemistry is there. Everyone yeah. nails it. What was it like searching for these iconic people uh, in the acting world? Uh, yeah, well, it was scary because casting is, it's like 99% you know just get good actors and get them to say mm. get them to act really well you know which 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 we did but you know thankfully we had an amazing casting director danny of course takes casting very very seriously but it is scary because you it's kind of sitting there going and it's not that you're not seeing endless amounts of good actors it's it but you have to get not only a great actor but a great actor who can embody those particular characteristics of that character and they are very distinct characters you know there was a reason you know one of the reasons they became so famous and such an influence on the world is because they're all very very strong in particular characters in their own way so you know it's a lot of work you have to be very diligent actually you have to because sometimes it's like oh are they are they are they right or maybe they're not we thought thomas was too young at first to play Malcolm, you know. Oh. And then we're like, no, hang on. He 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 was exactly Thomas's age. You know, Thomas mm -hmm. has a very boyish look about him. So did Malcolm. <laughs> and he's this father figure. But that is a big part of the story, that he is this father figure to them. But that's just because they are so young in the band, you know, the Pistols. And also Steve never had a father, you know, mm -hmm. uh, didn't know his biological father. His stepfather was a really horrible, abusive person. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Thomas, sorry, Malcolm stood up for 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 um, for Steve in court. He took a chance on him, and that was the best Steve had, the closest he ever had to a to a to a father. But of course, you know, Malcolm was an unreliable father figure. He didn't want to be a father figure, and he was only twenty nine right. years old. But, but it was a, to answer your question, it was a long and rich but scary journey and we were like wow okay they're right they're right they're right um and we we did find an amazing cast who we are eternally grateful to well i mean everyone is amazing i really really enjoyed the series um and i wanted to thank you for for being a part of it and uh for talking with me today thank you very much thank you well i, I thank you so much for talking to me about pistol uh Taking on the story of the Sex Pistols is obviously no easy task. What was it that inspired you to take on this story at this point in time? Well, I kind of lived through it, really. I would have been, um, I, I was sort of an open door, really, when they sent, when they sent the, the, the first episode. The, my only hesitation about, I, I'd always wanted to make a film about punk, 
because it's such a big formative part of my life. Um, mm -hmm. My only my only hesitation was I, I never thought I would do one about the Sex Pistols because there was such a there was, there's such a an electric current of hostility runs around them. They're always falling out with each other ever you know in the fifty almost fifty years that have passed since they were together. That I thought, how would you ever get inside that? And then this Steve Jones's book is a little back door or side door in, and you can get inside the world and establish yourself and then welcome into it. Characters like Johnny Rotten, who were brought in and named as part of the process. So it sort of gave you a confidence about how to, that this was a way in, like a Trojan horse in, in, a, in effect, that you were inside the citadel and then you could make your own way around how, the way you told it. So from having, having realised that, then, uh, like I said, uh, well, I was an open door I, because the chance to recreate the 70s and, and, uh, and, and what they meant to the 70s, the, the way they disrupted the, the pattern of life was so important for me personally and also for British society in general. And I imagine ricochets around the world as well. Absolutely. And it felt really authentic. I mean, with the, the footage and just the way that the performances were, um, how did you achieve this kind of authenticity in the performances? They are brilliant actors. You, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, you, can, you can have all the geniuses in the world on camera, on directing and writing. And if the actors aren't on it, it's good night, really. And so it's casting. Mm -hmm. It's 98% yeah. of it, I think. I mean, and we were, it was wonderful to find. We also benefited, I think it was, we, we did this right the way through COVID, through lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I think the actors were desperate to work, mm -hmm. you know, so they had an energy about, an appetite for it. Even though they knew nothing about it, we had to explain everything about them because they didn't really know about the pistols very much. Mm -hmm. But they had an appetite once they found out about it. And that connected. And they're quite large characters. They're not unapologetic. They're quite uncompromising characters. So there's a chance to play strong as well. And also learn to be a group, which means learning the music, but also meaning what it means to be a group. Because that's not just playing instruments. It's a group mentality. There's wonderful challenges for them. So we benefited from some great casting and we were very lucky to get them all. And they kind of like blazed away because the world left us alone because it, everybody, nobody, could, nobody could come. People weren't allowed to travel from Los Angeles, so we were left alone just to get on with it in London. You know, it was an amazing period. Yeah, Anson said whenever they were performing, he, he would almost lose sight of the fact that he was being filmed because of, of just how real everything felt for them. Yeah, no, we, we obviously wanted to try and create that if we could, yeah. That was the idea of it. I mean, he, they, they, I mean he, that's also... He, they were so committed to their performances that they weren't even, that they, weren't, they weren't really doing it for cameras. They were just doing it, mm -hmm. you know, because they could do it and they got better and better and better at the songs. And for people, like when the extras, the supporting artists came mm -hmm. in for the crowd scenes, they'd also mm -hmm. been in lockdown. They hadn't seen mm -hmm. any live music for like a year. And suddenly there was this band in front of them who could really play. So no wonder they lost sight of where we were with the cameras. And we were following the principles of chaos. We weren't telling people, yeah. You're gonna, this is going to be a close-up, this is going to be a two-shot. It was just like, perform and we'll make our way around and see what we get. I love that. I love the principles of chaos. And I, I really enjoyed the series. Uh, so thank you so much for, for your time and for creating it. Oh, brilliant. Great. Thank you. <laughs>